Number six, prayer and loving your neighbor is the way. Prayer and loving your neighbor is the way. Sound bites and cliches is not the way. Hearts are not ch changed by sound bites and cliches. Hearts are not even changed by legislation. Prayer and loving your neighbor is the way. Two more. The kingdom of God is an upside down revolution of sacrifice and love. The kingdom of God is an upside down revolution. It is a revolution that we are part of, but it's, it's one of sacrifice and suffering love. When Jesus came, it was not about political restoration. It was about loving your neighbor. Thanks, Dan. And Bill Bates put those pictures together for a little slideshow from previous trips. There is a cost involved, and this year the church budgeted some monies and laid that aside for anyone who'd like to go but can't afford to go. So don't let, when you go online to register, don't let that cost uh, prevent you from going. So just let the church office know if we can help you uh, going. One mission, uh, I think we go at least once a year. We'd like to go a, a couple times a year, but uh, October is our, our next trip. So we're beginning a new series today called Jesus And, and the foundation for the whole series is called The Kingdom of God. That's this week. And every week we're going to be looking at a specific issue that our culture is facing and wrestling with. Our culture is in a state of confusion on a number of things, and we're going to take some time to address that. As we begin the series, I'm going to ask for some grace on a couple areas. Typically, Boulder Mountain, we walk through a passage of Scripture, a book of the Bible, a couple chapters, we walk through that. During this series, we're going to do something a little bit different. We'll go back to that. That's who we are as Boulder Mountain. We'll keep doing that. But we're going to address some issues head on. And you may be asking why, and I would respond, why not? I believe that Jesus always has a better word than our culture has about any issue and every, every, any topic. When we walk through a passage of the Bible, it'll address many of these issues, but we'd only spend a few minutes on each one as we go through the text. This allows us to address, spend a whole sermon addressing one of the issues. Karl Barth, a German theologian, says the best way to preach the Bible is the Bible in one hand and a newspaper in the other as a way to engage our culture. Because here's what I know to be true. The issues of the day impact us as well. We have family members, we have friends, we have coworkers, we have people we live with who are wrestling with many of the issues that we're going to be talking about. And what Jesus has to say to us, he gives us words of hope, he gives us words of freedom, truth, and grace. No matter what the issues, this is what Jesus have, has to give to us. Truth, hope, freedom, and grace. This sermon today will be the foundation for the Jesus and. And we'll talk about abortion, gender, gender identity, sexuality, politics, right? How excited are you? I will be changing my email address for this sermon series. <laughs> but again, I think, I think Jesus wants us to address these things and not to withdraw, not to hide out in our basements, not to run away, but to engage our, our culture with these. But there's a right way to do it. And as we have friends and family members who are wrestling with different things, there's a right way to address it. It's not just truth, it includes truth. But it's not just truth. It's not just grace. It's truth and grace. It's loving first and leading second, but always doing both of those. It's not sacrificing truth for love. And it's not sacrificing love for truth. Jesus does both. You'll never find anybody more loving than Jesus, and you'll never find anybody more honest than Jesus. Jesus was the kindest man 
to ever walk the face of the earth, and yet he was nailed to a cross. What does it mean for us to be in the world but not of the world? Romans 12 tells us, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world. And so why are we going to do this series? Because we need to understand what the patterns of the world are in order to be not conformed by the patterns of this world. So I'm going to ask for some grace. Some of us in the room will feel like as we walk through these, we didn't go far enough. And others of us in the room may feel like, oh, you went too far. But here's what I'm going to ask, and I'm, I'm asking myself this as well, that each week we would come humbly to the truth of God's word, and we would first look inward before we look outward. We would first look at our own hearts and be more concerned with what's in here than what's out there. Listen, it is really easy to be concerned with what's out there. But Jesus, when he speaks to us, he has a word for us to address what's in here. And I want to give you just this message of hope before we dive in. Jesus is not panicked. Jesus is doing okay. He is on his throne. He is on his throne right now. He is not panicked by what's happening in the world today. In fact, he's seen much worse. Okay? So we're going to walk through this series together. I would ask that you would pray. Uh, pray for our church as we wrestle through this. I'm going to be praying for you, be praying for your friends and family members. If you invite a friend or you send the sermon to them, you text them, you got to listen to the sermon, uh, consider this message because this message will set the tone and the foundation for the other messages, if that makes sense. So today we're talking about the kingdom of God. Why would we talk about the kingdom of God? Because it's the number one topic that Jesus talked about. 126 times Jesus talks about the kingdom of God. It's a really important topic. And it's easy to be confused by the kingdom of God because Jesus speaks in parables and a lot of what he describes the kingdom of God can seem to be contradiction with what he speaks about. For example, he says the kingdom of God is here. It's at hand. And then he says the kingdom of God is going to come. And you're like, okay. Jesus, what, like, what is it? Is it here now or is it, is it to come? He says it's like a net when you throw it out in the sea and you're fishing. He says it's like uh, a farmer sowing seeds. He says it's for children, but it's also for adults. The kingdom of God. So what is it? Is it here or is it coming? The answer is yes. It is here, but it's also coming. Friends in Phoenix, those of us who live in Phoenix, right? Winter's coming. C.S. Lewis always said spring is coming, but we flip it because we live in Phoenix. Winter's coming. Is it here yet? No, but we know it's coming. The first 70 degree low is, I think, tomorrow. The high is in the 90s, like a week from today. Is it here yet? No, but we know it's coming. It's like Chick-fil-A. They're closed today, but we know they're open just a couple of miles away, right? It's this both and. They're closed on Sundays, but we know... They're going to be open. It's the difference between D-Day and V-Day. As a follower of Jesus, there's still a war going on. We know who wins. There's a battle going on, and the land and the, where you walk every day is contested land and contested soil. Because this is not our home. We are citizens of heaven. We are citizens of another kingdom. And the kingdom does not look like the kingdom of this world or the kingdom of man. When Jesus shows up, he does not show up with an army. He does not show up with tanks and drones. Jesus shows up silently in the middle of nowhere in a manger. But he is no less a king. Jesus never had a crown, a golden crown. Jesus never had a throne on this earth. Jesus never had a palace, and Jesus never had a flag. But he is our king. Jesus has come. And he's coming uh, back, back again one day. Matthew 6, verse 33. This is given the best sermon that's ever been recorded is the Sermon on the Mount. When revolutionaries came, they spoke from a mountain. And Jesus was no different. Matthew 6, middle of the Sermon on the Mount. And we focus on verse 33. Church, Boulder Mountain, followers of Jesus, but seek first the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of man. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Anytime 
you are part of an organization or a business or a team, when somebody new comes in to take over, and we've all been there, somebody comes in and says, it's a new day. There's a new set of values. I know the old coach focused on defense, but we're going to focus on offense, right? I know the old company did it this way, but I'm the new leader, and I'm going to do it this way. And so they come in, they, they set a new set of values. They have the power to do so. They have the authority to do so because of their position. And they say, if we do this, we're going to be a better company. We're going to be a better team. We've all been a part of this. Somebody comes in new and you kind of question it. And they say, we're going to do things differently. And then we're going to win. If we put these values in, we're going to win. Jesus shows up. He does the same thing. Jesus says, you've heard it said, but now I tell you. All through this best sermon that's ever been preached, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And in the middle of that, he says, but seek first the kingdom of God. Do you seek, without showing hands, do you seek first the kingdom of God in your marriage, in your relationships, in your career, in your finances? Are you seeking God first in those, in those areas? This is what Jesus says. He says, when he showed up and he said a new kingdom on earth, he said, these are the values of the old kingdom. These are the values of the man kingdom, the kingdom of earth. They're values like power and strength and recognition. That's what this world is seeking. But Jesus comes and he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. That's a new set of values. Blessed are, are the weak, the meek. Blessed, blessed are the persecuted. Blessed are those who know they're poor in spirit, right? What's it mean to be poor in spirit? When you say, God, you owe me nothing. I deserve nothing. God, I can't, I can't believe you love me. That's what it means to be poor in spirit. What does it mean to be middle class in spirit? It means, God, you owe me something. I'm a pretty good person. Look at all the things I've done. You owe me something. That's what it means to be middle class in spirit. But Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, right? The kingdom of God. And every one of us here today, we're one of two kingdoms. The kingdom of man, kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of this earth, or the kingdom of God. There was a perfect kingdom when God created Adam and Eve and placed them in the garden. That was the first kingdom. It was a pretty good kingdom. Everything was perfect. Adam and Eve, you are rulers of this kingdom. And you're going to have some work to do. There's a job to be done. You're going to rule. I'm going to give you dominion over all the animals and over creation. And there's a job to do. You're not just going to sit around and listen to the birds chirping. There's a job to do. Be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth, right? There's a job to do. This is the first kingdom. And Satan gets kicked out of heaven. I wish we had a little more information on that in the Bible. It's one of those stories. Like, I need more context and info. But uh, Mel Gibson's going to try to portray that in his film uh, at Easter next year. I, I don't know how he's going to do that. But Satan falls from heaven and takes a third of the angels. And now there's a war here on earth. The dominion that God gave Adam and Eve and the kingdom that Satan now has. And there is a battle going on. Ever since then, there's been a war and a battle going on on this earth. And when you enter into the kingdom of God, and you're like, oh, how do I enter into the kingdom of God? Jesus makes it really, really, really clear. Repent and, and be saved. Repent and believe. Right? Repent. Turn away from your sins. Recognize that you are not in charge. You are not on the throne of your life. That place God on the throne of your life. You see, in every area of your life, either you're on the throne or God's on the throne. That's the biggest challenge facing our culture today is autonomy. And the American church and American culture is all about independence and autonomy. We don't like kingdoms in America, right? We got rid of a kingdom. Autonomy. Who's, who's in charge of your life? Who's on the throne of your life? Is it God? Or is it you? And that's ultimately the question every week as we go through this series. Who's in charge? Jesus says, but seek first the kingdom of God. Don't seek first power. Don't seek first greatness. Don't seek first success. Jesus says, oh, there's a better way. When you follow Jesus, there's always a better word and always a better way. Mark chapter 10. We don't have this passage on screen, but let me explain it to you. Mark chapter 10 is recorded the most embarrassing moment of James and John's life. 
Aren't you glad your most embarrassing moment wasn't put in a book written 2,000 years ago that everybody's going to study for 2,000 years? Amen? Well, that wasn't true for James and John. James and John, verse 32 of Mark 10. So we talk about the kingdom of God. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem. And Jesus was walking ahead of them. Every great leader, Jesus is the best leader who's ever lived. And he is walking in front. That's what leaders do. Leaders lead. He's walking up to Jerusalem. He's walking up in front of them. They were amazed that those who followed were afraid. And taking the 12 again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, see, we are going up to Jerusalem. He's going to explain to them what's going to happen to him in just a few days. And the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. Could he have been more clear to his disciples? To the 12, and then there were other secondary disciples following along. He makes it really clear what's going to happen to him. And then James and John speak up, most embarrassing moment of their life. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, and Zebedee's like, don't bring me into this for the words of, of their sons. But they, these two men come up to Jesus. Now, given the context of what he just described is going to happen to them, they come up to him. And they say, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Now, this is like when little kids come to their parents and, mom, dad, can you do something for me? You don't know the specific request, but they're, they're putting you into a corner. They want you to say yes before they really ask, yeah? It's happening to Jesus. Disciples are doing the same thing. Hey, would you be willing to do something for us? Now, Jesus is smarter than they are. And so he says to them, uh, what do you want me to do for you? And he said to them, uh, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Yeah, we heard that they're going to kill you and spit on you and mock you and flog you. But you're going to need a number two and a number three guy, right? Every good leader needs a number two and a number three. And we're just volunteering ourselves. Can you, can you reserve those seats for us? They're, they're living under a different set of values. They're living under an old kingdom that was all about power and prestige and recognition. And they asked Jesus this question. And Jesus said to them, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able. He's like, are you, are you, you prepared to drink the cup of the wrath? Are you prepared to be persecuted and suffer as I'm going to suffer. And they're like, we're all in, Jesus. You know us. We're all in. A couple of weeks later, they're not in anymore. Right? They run away, scared. And, and Jesus goes, down, goes to explain what the kingdom of God is. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. Why were they mad at James and John? Not because they asked a dumb question, but because they asked it and they didn't. Like, we want to be it. We want to be next to Jesus. Why are you asking? We want to be. And Jesus called them to hint to him and said to him, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. This is the kingdom of the world. But it shall not be so among you. Four words that we're going to talk over and over and over about as we go through this series. But not so with you. Not so with you. Say it with me. Not so with you. This is how the world thinks about sexuality. Not so with you. This is how the world fights with other people. Not so with you. This is how the world views marriage. Not so with you. This is how the world views position and authority. Not so with you. The kingdom of God. Not so with you. It is a different set of values, followers of Jesus. We do not live under the values of this world. Jesus says, but not so with you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. So the values of Jesus, right? His right side values of this world, that makes sense to all our, our friends and family members who don't know Jesus. And then Jesus flips everything upside down. He says, you want to be first, you must be last. You want to be great, you must be a slave. Some translations use the word slave here. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. 
For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's the kingdom of God. It flips the values upside down. The kingdom of God. You want to see this in action? The early church, Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Paul is preaching. I think we have this text on the screen. Paul is preaching. Acts, middle of Acts. This is the beginning of the early church. You want to know what the church did and how the church outlasted the Roman Empire? This is what happened. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, I think I butchered that, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue to the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures. He preached for three weeks, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. Right? What did they do? They preached Christ. The early church pointed people to Jesus. The early church said, we have no king but King Jesus. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed it, they formed a mob, and set the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. What were they being accused of? They turned the world upside down. What did Jesus do? He flipped the world upside down. The values of the world are different than the values of the kingdom of God. They were dragged from their homes. Why? Because they were preaching Jesus and Jesus alone. Their goal wasn't to change culture. Their goal was to preach Jesus, and in that, the culture was changed. It's a really important concept. They were dragged, and Jason uh, has received them, and they're all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another King Jesus. This is Caesar Augustus. He ruled for about 40 years. He was, the, he was the guy in charge during the census when Jesus came into the world for 40 years. Their coins that they had, that they used, everyday currency, literally said, Augustus, a son of God. Okay? So their coins said Augustus was a son of God. This is the Caesar. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. So one thing that never changes, the thing that never changes, uh, bribery. No, no matter the time, no matter the country, no matter where you're at, money works, right? And so they bribe them and they, they get out. They turn the world upside down. Church, when we follow after our king and we live under his values, the world gets turned upside down. It is not about power and prestige and recognition. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who grieve. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. The early church was known for a number of things. The early church when Romans had baby girls born. They didn't want baby girls. And so they would carry these babies to the edge of the forest and they would allow nature to take the course of these babies. Be wild animals would come or hypothermia or nature would, would kill these babies. But the early Christians went and found the babies and took them in and treated them as their own. That's how the early church and they, their issues that they face could cost them their life. The issues that we have in our culture are significant issues. But for most of us, and many of us, day to day, will not cost us our lives. But the early church, they were willing to live with a my life for you. In every aspect. My life for you. Which is the value that Jesus taught his, his followers. Jesus says there's a better way. The world lives with a your life for me mentality. You serve me, you give to me. And Jesus flips it up upside down, doesn't he? Between 250 and 270 AD, a terrible plague believed to be measles or smallpox devastated the Roman Empire at the height of what came to be known as the Plague of Cyprian. 
after the bishop of St. Cyprian who chronicled what was happening. 5,000 people were dying in Rome every day. The plague coincided with the first empire-wide persecution of Christians under the emperor Decius. Not surprisingly, Decius and the other enemies of the church blamed Christians for the plague, just like Nero did with the great fire of Rome. Blamed the Christians for starting it, even though he was using fire to burn Christians, right? To light his garden at night, he was be burning Christians. That claim was, however, undermined by two inconvenient facts. Number one, Christians were also dying of the plague. And unlike everybody else, they cared for the victims of the plague, including their pagan neighbors. What does it mean to be part of the kingdom of God? They ran toward the plague rather than away from the plague. This wasn't new. Christians had done the same thing during the Anton plague a century earlier. As Rodney Stark wrote in The Rise of Christianity, Christians stayed in the afflicted cities when pagan leaders, including the physicians, fled. Candida Moss, a professor of New Testament and early Christianity at Notre Dame, notes that an epidemic that seemed like the end of the world actually promoted the spread of Christianity. By their actions in the face of possible death, Christians showed their neighbors that Christianity is worth dying for. That's what it means to be part of the kingdom of God. My life for you. Four words, Jesus tells James and John, not so for you. This is how the world lives. This is how the world views this issue. This is how the world views sexuality and marriage and abortion and all these issues. Not so for you. And so naturally, naturally left alone to our own feelings on these issues, we'll either lean toward indifference and withdrawal and not engage, which is not the way of Jesus, or we lean this way and we get into fight mode and attack mode, which is not the way of Jesus. What is the way of Jesus? To speak truth. And what we're going to do at Boulder Mountain, we're going to give you the full counsel of truth of God's word. Because without that, we stand on nothing. We're going to look at God's word and what God's word has to say. We're going to allow God's word to shine into our hearts in places that might need to be changed. But it's not this way and it's not this way. It's truth and grace. It's love first and lead second. It's we're, we're not going to compromise biblical truth. But how can I do that and still be gracious and loving to my family member, my neighbor, and my coworker? I've had it said to me after intense conversations, somebody has said to me, it feels like I just got punched and hugged at the same time. And that is the power of the Holy Spirit. And so as you engage with our culture, you speak truth, but you love. And you love and you speak truth. Both can be true. And no one did it better than Jesus. You'll never find more love than you'll find in the person of Jesus. You'll never find more truth than you'll find in the person of Jesus. How do you enter the kingdom of God? Repent and believe. Does the kingdom of God have rule and authority over every area of your life? If not, he wants, he wants rule and authority. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, this is, this is difficult to speak truth and to love at the same time. Because have you ever been in a conversation where you want to give the answer that the person you're talking to wants to hear? Several times in, in my life, I've, I've found myself in a position where I'm like, oh, there's an easy answer and there's a right answer. And they're not always the same. When I was on a barge paying my way through college, I worked on a towboat from New Orleans up to Pittsburgh, the Mississippi and Ohio rivers. And I worked with a, a rough group of guys. I was 20 in Bible school, and they had a very different background. Uh, my mate, who I reported to, his nickname was Killer. And I remember late one night having a conversation. He's like, you don't really believe, you don't believe in this stuff like, Marriage and sex outside of marriage is wrong. And I mean, he was just coming at me, right? And did I say his name's Killer? <laughs> I'm like, well, yeah, I do. Right? There's a right answer and, and a simple answer. And the simple answer, oh, well, yeah. I want to be liked. I'll just be honest. I'm going to bear my heart and soul to you guys. I want to be liked. I want to be one of the good guys. I want to end conversations with everybody's like, oh, that was amazing. And thank you. This is wonderful. But listen. When the cross is preached, Paul writes in Galatians that to the Jews it's a stumbling block and to the Greeks it's offensive. 
And so speak truth, and there is a right way to speak truth. Don't hear what I'm not saying. Speak truth, but do it in grace and love. But also know not everybody will like what you have to say and agree with what you have to say. Paul, when he preached, he, he says the cross is offensive to some people. Not everybody is going to want to hear it. But here's what I want to be known for as a, as a church at Boulder Mountain. We want to be engaging with people, not withdrawing. And this would have been easy. I just ignore these topics. We'll let everybody figure it out on their own. But again, Jesus has words of wisdom in these issues. There's a right way to address and respond and still save the relationship while, while speaking truth. Here's, here's what I've come to learn. That I'm not, ultimately I'm not accountable to the people I have conversations with one day. Right? I'm not accountable to killer on how I choose to live my life, right? Or to the people at the dog park. That's my mission field, the dog park. You guys have heard me talk about the dog park. People far from God. Uh, I'm like the bartender at the dog park now. Everybody comes to me. It's 5 a.m. They're sharing their, all their hurts and what happened that week. And uh, this guy this week, his mom passed away. He's tearing up. And I'm like, it's 5 o'clock in the morning. I just want to bring my dog to the dog park. But God says, this is your mission field. But I am accountable to Jesus. I will stand before him and be accountable to him and how I live my life. And the same is true for you. You're not accountable to everyone else. You're accountable to Jesus. And he models for us how we speak truth and love. It's not either or. It's both and. It's both and in, in all of these areas. It's interesting, isn't it, the early Christians... I wonder what they thought or I wonder what they think now, the saints, the martyrs around the throne in heaven. Because the Roman Colosseum, you can go there today and pay 20 bucks and get a, a tour of, of the Roman Colosseum. Why? Because it's in shambles. It did not last. The kingdom of man will not last. But the early church did. The church continues to grow. There are, there are things happening, news stories all across our country of the church growing all across the world. I mean, I saw stories this week of thousands of college students getting baptized at college camp, public universities. God is on the move. The church is on the move. The kingdoms of this world will come and go. Kings will come and go, and dictators will come and go, and presidents will come and go. The church will march on. The kingdom of God will stand forever. There's a a manifesto, if I can read some of these to you, if I can propose that. Uh, a follower of Jesus' manifesto as we go through this series. And uh, we don't have them in your notes today, but I'll maybe try to share it on social media or send it out in an email, but or you can jot them down in your notes. But here's a few things as we close today. Your fundamental, number one, your fundamental identity is as a son or a daughter of the king. That is your identity. It is not found in the kingdom of this world. It is not found in any position or title that this world can give to you. You are a son and a daughter of the king, and you're his favorite. Number two, we are captive to the word of God and not to the words of politicians, bloggers, or other leaders of this world. We are captive to the word of God. Number three, following Jesus is a public expression not a private one. Let me say that again. Following Jesus is not about hiding out in our basement or running off to a monastery. To be a follower of Jesus means it is public. And you have to figure that out, what that looks like in your life with the power of the Holy Spirit leading you. We are not to hide our light under a bushel. There's an old song, right? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. I'm not going to sing it for you. Hide it under a bushel? No. Let your light shine. Your faith is not to be a private faith. It is to be a public faith. Number four, we're called to model a posture of faithful engagement and not withdrawal or acquiescence. Right? We're not to be indifferent to the issues of our world. We are to engage, but there's a right way to engage. Number five, let our engagement be marked by the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruit of the world. 
when you are done with that conversation with your friend or family member, may they feel like they just got punched and hugged at the same time, okay? I, I hope you know it. Not, I'm not talking physical punching, just to clarify. But you, may they feel like there was gentleness and peace and joy in that conversation. Number six, prayer and loving your neighbor is the way. Prayer and loving your neighbor is the way. Sound bites and cliches is not the way. Hearts are not ch changed by sound bites and cliches. Hearts are not even changed by legislation. Prayer and loving your neighbor is the way. Two more. The kingdom of God is an upside down revolution of sacrifice and love. The kingdom of God is an upside down revolution. It is a revolution that we are part of, but it's, it's one of sacrifice and suffering love. When Jesus came, it was not about political restoration. It was about loving your neighbor. The last one, the king is returning, so be people of hope and courage. The king is coming back. We are in the in-between. We know, we know who wins. We know who has victory. He's coming back. So let's be people of hope. Let's be people of courage. Let's not be afraid to, to speak truth. But when we speak truth, let's, let's be as loving as possible. How do you enter the kingdom of God? Repent and believe. Turn from, turn from the reality that you've been on the throne of your life. And maybe for some of us, we are part of the kingdom of God, but we're living in the dawn of the morning. And the dawn of the morning, you're trying to live in the day and the night. Because right 4 a.m., is it morning or is it night? Some of us are living in the dawn of the morning. We're trying to have a foot in both worlds. And Jesus makes it really clear. You're part of the kingdom of God. You're part of the kingdom of the world. Maybe for some of us, there's one area of our life that we're still living in the world values in this particular area. And the words of Jesus today, they're gracious words. They're, love, they're words of love and freedom and grace and truth. Repent. Repent. Turn away. Turn toward him. Again, in him, you'll never find anyone more loving than him. You'll never find anyone more truthful. And in that truth, the truth given to us is not just so we can win an argument. It's so that we can be set free. Truth sets people free. That's my prayer for us as we go through this series. This series that's going to be founded on the kingdom of God, the Jesus and. And the question we're going to wrestle with every week is the autonomy. Am I on the throne or is God on the throne? Is this what I want? Or is this what God wants? Here's what Jesus said. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Maybe as we go through this series, that's our prayer. Every morning you wake up, God, not my will be done. Your will be done. Your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Would you pray with me? Father, in these areas we're going to be walking through, I pray you'd give us wisdom, give us insight. These are, these are very real issues that impact relationships in the room. They impact our families. They impact coworkers. And may we run toward the plague. May we live under a different set of values. Give us wisdom, but also give us the courage to do, Father, what you're asking us to do. Thank you that Jesus has given us a better way to live, a way that says my life for you. Father, if there's uh, repentance that needs to occur, I pr pray right where we're standing there in our row, we can do that with you. We can do business with you. We can confess to you. We can admit to you. We can say, I want you, God, to have rule over my life in this area. I want to submit to the King of kings and the Lord of lords in my life. 
to the one true king. And so, Holy Spirit, move and have your freedom in the room this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to take a moment to say thank you for joining us for today's service online. I'm going to invite you to our website where there are a number of different action steps to take following today's service. Maybe joining a small group or finding a place to serve or sending a prayer request into the church to let us know how we can help you and how we can be praying for you. If you found this message today encouraging and supportive, I'm going to ask you to like or share or comment and let us know and, and share that with your friends. If it's been an encouragement to you, I trust you'll be an encouragement to others as you share this resource. Hey, we've been praying for you. We're going to continue to pray for you throughout this week and trust you'll join us again next weekend. Have a great week.